today is abstain from sexual immorality. And we're going to talk a little bit about sex and sexual immorality. Now, I could not cover all that I wanted to cover. We're going to cover just some of the things that I needed or I saw fit to cover as we move forward in what the early church and what is happening and what is being built upon the early church. And I found it very important to stick to sexual immorality just for this sermon. And I find that even when James is um, instructing and giving this encouragement over the Gentiles not to burden them with any more than the gospel, but to abstain from these four things so that the fellowship between the Jew and the Gentile would be um, you know, peaceable and united and that they would be one. I think there's a strong emphasis um, on sexual immorality. More of the other ones abstaining from things polluted by idols, by what was strangled by uh, the meat that was strangled and through blood. Um, when you look at Paul's writings to the Corinthians about eating things not polluted to, food, uh, polluted to idols, he said, um, you have the right to do that. But for the sake of your brother, for the sake of those that are weak, abstain from these things. If it stumbles him, don't eat meat. So these three things are more of an encouragement, but I really believe when you look at from the Old Testament from the beginning all the way to the new, the instruction of sexual immorality is not just an encouragement or, you know, it's not a, a, a request. It actually falls under a, a, a very heavy commandment. And it's for the sake of the purity of yourself and the purity of the church. And more than abstaining from sexual immorality and having it as just an encouragement, oh, I hope you can stay away from this, you'll see that even Paul and the rest of the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament are strongly commanding that we abstain from sexual immorality. So we'll get into it, and it's from the same uh, verses that we left off. We're not moving forward. We're staying to chapter 15. We'll continue on to chapter 16 next week. But again, abstain from sexual immorality. I'm going to read the verses again, the same from last, and we'll begin. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses had had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today, Lord. Lord, I loved what um, Tim just prayed, and we did have a talk about just asking for the things that you have given to us once again, that we would be able to dream dreams, have visions, prophesy, and move according to your Holy Spirit. We are in desperate need of your Spirit today. Holy Spirit, you are the one who leads. You are Lord. You convict. You empower. Lord, it is you that moves and works right now, and we ask that you would come and you would fill our lives and this place to be about making disciples, to be about sending disciples for the glory of the risen Son, Jesus Christ. May everything that we do here be about the glory of Jesus, Lord. So we thank you, and we ask that you would prepare us for all of these things, Lord. Let your word come to life in our lives. May your word be loved, desired in this place, Lord, that we would love and obey your word. So we thank you. May your word bear fruit today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Talk on sex. It's uncomfortable. It might be uncomfortable coming from me. But talk on sex. You know, I never had that talk of sex and the immorality of sexual issues with my parents. Never went through that. I learned all of sex and the immoralities of sex through friends, through the world, through very corrupted and perverted ways. And so as a Korean American, especially in the context of the church, we kind of brush it all under the bed or under the rug. We don't talk about it, and we only address these issues when it's usually too late. And we talk about these things when it's a have-to situation. But I wanted to talk about sex and kind of stay here this Sunday because I really believe it's an important topic that we talk about in the church. And once again, um, I, I was going over marital counseling with Leslie, and Leslie was asking such a, a good question. Why don't we talk about sex in the church? 
She was asking, how come I didn't learn about sex in the church? And this is the place where you should learn about sex. God is the one who created sex. He ordained sex. And so sex should be addressed in the church. But I think a lot of the times because of uh, our upbringing and because we are Korean Americans, we grow up in a, such a shame and honor uh, kind of culture and system. A lot of the times it's kind of shameful to talk about sex. It's embarrassing. And it's because we may hold some secrets. It may be an undoing of sorts for some of us to express these things, talk about these things, because some things may come to light that are very uncomfortable. Issues with pornography, issues with masturbation, issues with maybe some of us have issues with homosexuality. Some of us may have sexual addictions. Some of us may having sex outside of marriage. Some of us that are dating may have already fallen into the temptation of sex. And it's very important for us to address these things because the more that you bring these things uh, into the light, the more we can overcome through Christ. But if we keep it hidden and in the dark, sin grows and loves to grow in those hidden places. So even in your family groups, even in the midst of your brotherhood and your sisterhood, it is good to address these things, to bring these things to light, that we may come to a place of repentance, of healing, of restoring. Now, sex, again, in its right context, is nothing to be shamed about, nothing to be embarrassed about. Again, God created sex. He created it. He created it for us to enjoy as married couples. We all know that sex has, we're going to go through the biblical view of sex. Sex is very pleasurable. And God created it to be pleasurable. He created that pleasure. So we need to have a right view of sex today. So the world corrupted and perverted sex for us. I think because we learn sex and sexual immorality all outside of the church, our view has been skewed, our perspective is all jaded and twisted, and we need to relearn what God instituted through sex. And where, you know, so the perversion and corruption of sex, when you think about it, it comes through adultery, it comes through pornography, it comes through homosexuality. It comes through pedophilia. It comes through bestiality. There is a long list of sexual immorality that goes on and on because when wickedness goes deep, all sorts of, there's all sorts of ways where sin goes crazy. And I want you guys to even know there's issues of sex slavery still going on right now. There's issues of sex trafficking still going on right now. And we need to be aware of these things, to fight against these things. And there is a way to fight against it. Where does this perversion and corruption come from? And I want to talk about this in Romans chapter 1, 24, 29. I actually iterate this. And a lot of our issues today in mankind, a lot of the issues that brings about sin, corruption, and perversion, not just through sex, but all things God ordained good, comes from this. It says, therefore, God gave them up. The reason God gave them up here in this verse is because Mankind saw God, knew God, but did not want to acknowledge God and rejected God. They wanted to go their own way. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. So you see what is happening here is there are already impurities because of sin, because of the fall that are in our hearts. We have lust, our flesh crave for pleasure. But God, when we come to God, God protects us, guards us, and keeps us safe from these things. In the flesh, it's not always so perfect, but he guards our bodies, our minds, our spirits, and our hearts. But when we give ourselves to reject him to our own ways, all of these things just start manifesting. We are given to them. And it says, for this reason, God gave them up because of the rejection to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. 
Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God again gave them up to a debased mind. It means the quality of their mind were lowered to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. And so when we reject God as a people and we do not acknowledge him in our lives, what happens to you is all kinds and all sorts of unrighteousness, wickedness starts manifesting from your life because your mind is not guarded by God anymore through his word, instructions, goodness, love, and spirit. So the reason why we have these issues, immorality issues, the reason why we have wickedness and all sorts of chaos in our world today because of a simple rejection of God. I want to do things my way. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. God is the one, you guys have to understand, God is the one who protects us. It is through him we move towards holiness. It is through him we have any resemblance or knowledge of what is good. It is through him we become pure. It is through him we are saved from ourselves in our sins and from our own wickedness, our own fleshly desires. That's why Christ, when he dies and we believe, we are made new. That old is gone, completely dead. And that newness starts taking over. And we all know that it isn't perfect. There's still that struggle. But God is progressing us into a place of holiness. Without him, we are given up to the lust of our own hearts. The lust from the fall, it's already there. We all have the sin issues that we deal with and the struggles, the things that our heart, our mind, our bodies are craving for. But when we come to God in place of repentance, believing in the gospel, believing in Christ and what he's done, it gives us the strength to guard us from these things, not to fall head over heels into them, protects us to keep us pure and holy. When we reject God, though, and are without God, we are again given up to a debased mind. All, righteous, all unrighteousness and all kinds of unrighteousness starts filling our lives. And because of this, we have issues again with adultery, homosexuality, pornography, prostitutions, sex slaves, and a lot of the times the culture of Progressive Christianity will talk about how the Bible and the biblical days and the authors of the Bible were in a different culture than the context of the culture we are in today. Let me tell you, a lot of um, progressive homosexual Christians use this tactic that the writers did not know the context of the culture we are going through today. Let me tell you this, homosexuality, transgender issues, issues of adultery, issues of wickedness, issues of all kinds of sexual immorality. You find it in the beginning of the book. It is nothing new. This is an age-old issue. The context of culture was the same. They were dealing with the same things from the beginning of the Bible. And we're going to go through this as God ordains or commands in Leviticus 18 all the things that they are to restrain from against having sex with certain people. It is an age-old issue. Now, I want to kind of give a personal testimony on this. When you really, this is why it's so important to be in a community, so important to guard your minds and each other for the sake of salvation. Because why? When you give yourself up to these sins and you reject God, we were having a conversation yesterday. As a Christian, when you believe in Jesus Christ and willfully sin, and you intentionally sin, you are in complete rejection of God. And when you are in complete rejection of God, guess what happens? Your sin in your life starts taking over. And I know that this is true because it happened in my life. I decided to reject God and go my own way. And when I decided that in my life, all sorts of sins started manifesting itself, and I did not care. Everything that my heart desired, I fulfilled. Sexual pleasure, drug pleasure, money pleasure, everything you name about pleasure, I fulfilled. That's what sin does. 
That's what all kinds of unrighteousness does. When God does not guard you, and you are not guarded by Christ and his spirit, you are let go into your own lust. And it's a road of destruction. Complete destruction. Utter destruction. You don't care about what happens to you, what happens to other people. Why? Because selfishness completely takes over. Only in Christ do I learn how to die to myself, to be a little bit more selfless, to think about others, to love others, and to actually care about someone else. But when you reject God, that all goes out the window. The core issue, guys, in sexual immorality, and if you guys are dealing with this, if you guys are dealing with pornography issues, if you guys are dealing with issues of masturbation, Issues with having sex and sexual addictions. Issues with the opposite. Issues with homosexuality. Most of these issues stems from your rejection of God. And so it is so crucial to come into a place of repentance that when you turn to God, God starts transforming, washing you pure and clean. Again, I say this all the time just because You stop having sex doesn't make you a Christian. Just because someone gay becomes straight doesn't make them a Christian. It really is them turning to God. It's them having Christ and believing in Christ. And Christ, through his power and his power alone, transforms someone to be the way they were created and to be free. And I am a testimony of that. I, through the power and my own strength, Um, We used to call, uh, me and my friends used to call all of us uh, professional quitters. We were professional quitters because we would quit so many times in all of the things that we used to dabble with. We would quit thousands of times. And you're like, oh, you're a professional quitter. It's your job. And I see the, the trouble that I had and the lack of strength and ability to cut off sin. But God, when I repented, dude, I was a drug addict for so many years. And for some reason, I literally, from from the moment I woke up to the moment I slept, I was high all day, all day. There was not a moment I was sober, and I lived like this for, dude, over a decade. But when God really came through and I repented, instantly I stopped. That is the power of God and only the power of God that makes transformation like that possible. Leviticus 18, so we must seek Christ, guys. We must love Christ and we must be in Christ. It is so important and you can make that decision right now. Leviticus 18, so Leviticus 17 and 18 discuss the four things that James was telling or instructing the the Gentiles to abstain from. Why? Because 17 and 18 actually deal with people who were sojourning into Israel. Strangers, aliens that were coming into the fold. And they had to obey those commands as well so to, to be in a part of Israel. So these, in chapter 18, specifically discusses the laws of sexual immorality. And these are the laws. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read you what, he, uh, what, what the law says. No sex with anyone who is near kin. No sex with any family members or near family members. No sex with, uh, no sex when women are on their menstruation, on their periods. No sex with your neighbor's wife. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech. And there's two meanings to this, or two possibility of meanings to this, because Molech was the, was a god that the Canaanites used to, um, um, worship. And Israel fell into that worship. And what they used to do was there was a statue, a bronze statue of Molech that has its hands like this, and the statue would sit on fire, and that bronze would be completely molten hot. And what they would do was they would get their infants and their babies, and they would put their infants on the hand of the statue, and the infant would burn and melt to death. And they would do that for prosperity so that they would have a good life and a prosperous life. Or there was another possibility where these children were given up as temple prostitutes. And so we see here, even in Molech 
and the way they would offer their infants and their babies to sacrifice for their own prosperous lives. And a lot of pastors and a lot of studies correlate this with even abortion. A lot of the times we sacrifice infants and people sacrifice infants just for financial stability. And we have to kind of think and rethink what life means for us today. No homosexuality, hot topic. I can't get too much into homosexuality issues. That's a complete whole new sermon on its own. No homosexuality. In Leviticus 18, God actually makes uh, 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 emphasis on this sin. He calls it an abomination to him. Homosexuality is something that God detests. It is something that does disgust God. And we have to understand that homosexuality is a, a, a wicked sin issue. And we do have to address it as sin, and we have to address it rightly. But there is redemption in these things, and we're going to get to that. But we have to understand as Christians that we don't take these sins so lightly like the world does. The world is all about tolerance and inclusion and acceptance. We have to understand that Jesus didn't command us to be tolerant of one another. He commanded us to love in truth. And we need to be standing on truth. No sex with animals. And he emphasizes this as well, that it is a perversion. And this is something that actually still happens today. This command was not to defile yourselves like the rest of the nations. God's command, especially sexually, was so that his people would be separate from the rest of the nations. The Gentile nations and the rest of the nations, with all their pagan worship, used to do crazy sexual immorality things that were unheard of. So he had to address, don't have sex with your family members. Who would need to address that? But God had to address that because all the un other nations were having sex with their family members, their father's wives, their mothers, their mother's mothers. They were having sex all sorts of ways. He had to actually address, don't have sex with animals. When I listen to this, it's not logical. It's like, why would he have to address this? He had to address it because it was happening in their time. And so these commands were to keep Israel separate and completely holy. Jews in the time when James was writing this, they were radically different and differentiating themselves from the Gentile nation through their sexual orientation. They kept themselves sexually pure. But the Gentiles dabbled in temple prostitution, dabbled in all sorts of sexual imm immorality. And what we have to understand as Christians today is that we separate ourselves from the rest of the world through our purity as well. And you must guard your purity. And I say this through my own fallen ways and through my own regrets, damages that have been done to me mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We as Christians, just like the Jews, completely severed that line. We have to keep ourselves pure. We need to be radically different, and this is our call. And I love this, and I get this from my study. It said, as a newly constituted people of God, we are to follow God's instructions to Israel for preserving the church's holiness. And when you look through 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6, 7, when you look at the rest of the New Testament, it, Paul is reiterating and emphasizing the church not to defile yourselves. Keep the church pure and holy for the church. You are the bride of Jesus Christ. This is something we have to guard with all of our being. Ephesians 5.3 says this. But sexual... <coughs> I choked. <coughs> There's a serious sexual immorality. Ephesians chapter 5. <coughs> 3. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you. As is proper among saints, you as followers, believers of Jesus Christ are saints. 
Sexual immorality must not be named among you. That's a serious and heavy call. And I know that is a hard call because of what I went through. But I was talking even with some of the boys yesterday. We have not put much effort. I know when I used to sin, I even put much effort into me not sitting, me saying no, me fighting the urges that are within me to protect myself and the church from sin. And Paul says, I love this. He says, you have not shed blood to stop sinning. That's how much we should be putting our effort and strength into keeping ourselves from sin. We need to try harder. We need to put more effort into saying no when we need to say no. But today we follow a lot of the world's instructions. Instead of preserving and protecting our holiness, we teach people, uh, instead of teaching them to abstain completely from sex, we sometimes understand the reality that we are going to have sex. So instead of emphasizing abstinence and keeping abstinence, the priority of the goal of sexual morality, of sex issues, we say, okay, if you're going to fall into uh, the sin, if you're going to fall into sexual immorality, if you're going to fall into having sex while you're dating and outside of marriage, then at least uh, use condoms. We teach, you know, safe sex. We teach birth control. But there's a danger to, 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 to teaching and emphasizing safe sex rather than the abstinence of sex because we take responsibility and consequence out of that sin. And that's a dangerous thing that you play with. And a lot of the times we find it in a worldly view. I'm not saying that. So before I continue. I'm going to choose my words wisely. I'm not saying that we should not be about safe sex. But our preaching and what we teach needs to be solely emphasized on the abstinence of sex until we are married. I think the way the world looks at love and views love and defines love, a lot of the times we fall into the teaching of safe sex because we don't want people to, um, there's disease. There's life on the line. There are consequences to having sex. And so we institute these things for the safety of someone. But when we do that, a lot of the times, we are more concerned about someone's physical well-being than their spiritual well-being. And we would damn people to hell rather than save someone and have someone suffer the consequence but be saved through that consequence. Salvation is more important than your physical body here on earth. Your eternal spirit is more important than the consequence of your physical body here. We have to understand that. We have to believe in that. When the responsibility and the consequence of sex and even all sin are taken away, what do you think happens? What do you think happens? You fall deeper into sin. When you have no responsibility and consequence of sin, man, you're going to sin, and you're going to sin until you can't sin no more. And I know I did that. And so I found this talk, and it was the sexual revolution of our day in America and how it boomed. And it stemmed from the 1960s. It was the invention of birth control. The invention of birth control and the marketing of birth control paved the way for the sexual revolution of the 1960s and the 1970s. When you take responsibility and consequence out of sin, people will go crazy. They will fall into that sin. Think about all the things you could do, and if you drank and did all the drugs and had no consequent responsibility afterwards, we would fall right into it, stealing, lying. Murder. There was no consequence and responsibility over it. You don't think people would do these things all the time? This is from an article. In 1960, half of 19-year-old women who were unmarried had not yet had sex. That's still a lot. Half. By the late 1980s, though, two-thirds of all women had done the deed by the time they were 18. By the time they were 18, two-thirds of all women already had sex. 
The invention of the birth control pill in the 1960s helped pave the way. Within five years after the first pill went on the market in 1960, six million American women were taking it. These women and others and their male partners entered the next de decade literally with a radically different experience of sex and freedom. And this was known as the revolution of sex in America. Sometimes we need to bear the burden of our sins so that we may fall into a place of repentance so that my spirit would be saved. And this breaks the fellowship. The reason why James, when you think about sexual morality, why James would have them institute uh, the abstination of sexual morality for the sake of fellowship is because it actually breaks the fellowship. It breaks the fellowship of you and God, and it breaks the fellowship between you and the church. Sexual immorality is porneia, and it's original. It's where we, you guys all know we've talked about this before. It's, it's where we get the word pornography. Sexual immorality, porneia, is where we get the word pornography. It means whoredom, fornication, and idolatry. Sexual immorality is idolatry. It is that you are your own God. It is a rejection of God, and it is a way of you instituting your own way and what you want to do. It is a surrendering of your sexual purity. So pornography, it comes from the concept of selling something off, selling off. So sexual immorality is the selling off of your sexual purity. It's literally whoring yourself. You're selling yourself. And this is where impurity comes from. And impurity comes from, and it means defiled, foul, and it means ceremonially unfit. The reason why the Jews had such strict sex laws was that they saw themselves as unfit ceremonially. They could not enter into God's presence. That was what impurity was derived from sexual morality. You could not enter into God's presence. It is impossible to maintain an intimate relationship with God when your bodies and souls are given to impurities. I understand the mistakes that we make. And when we mistake and we repent, we cover and we move forward in our lives. But if the issues of sex, pornography, and these things that you fall into are persistent, consistent, and continuous, there's an issue. And we will deal with those issues directly in this church. It breaks your fellowship with God. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. I wrote to you in my letter. This is Paul talking about. So what happened in the Corinthian church was there was a son, a father and his wife, but this was a new mom. The son had sex with the father's wife, and they were boasting about it in this church, and they were doing nothing about it, so Paul had to address this. And Paul had them remove this individual from the church, kick them out. And he even says, kick them out. Let Satan have his way with them for the destruction of his flesh so that at least his spirit may be saved. Salvation is the key. And a lot of the times, that's so hard to institute in the church. Why? Because of the, our cultural context. We don't want to offend people. It's not love to kick someone out. It's not love to excommunicate someone, but... Let me tell you this, when you're untruthful to a situation and you enable and continue to enable someone to destroy themselves, that is not love. But when you address in truth for the sake of the brother and the sister and we in faith excommunicate to save someone, that is love. Because we are looking out for their salvation. So 1 Corinthians 5, 9, 13, and Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. 
But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister if he is guilty of sexual immorality, greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunken, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. This is a crazy command and instruction for Paul. He says, for what have I do to, with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outsides. Purge the evil person from among you. It breaks the fellowship with the church. I was sharing this yesterday with some of the guys. A lot of, um, you know, I, I love, a lot of pastors always read, Iterate of Jesus and his ministry that Jesus was the master of making his ministry small. That if Jesus and Paul were the pastors of a church, that that church would be really small. Look at the way they guard and protect the church's holiness. Think about if we did that here. And I think that we need to kind of follow instructions like this to guard ourselves and those that are faithful to protect the bride of Christ. I don't think we take that seriously enough in this church. But look what Paul does. Paul clearly instructs you not to associate anybody that is sexually immoral. Anyone. He says, don't even eat with them. I wonder how small our church would be or how many people that we got to stop eating lunch with. It's funny, but at the same time, it's sad. It's scary. We need to start living a righteous life through Jesus Christ. We need to start understanding what God did to have us here in this place, to protect the purity of the church, to protect the purity of our brothers and our sisters. And if it means to excommunicate someone and not to associate, to protect those who are struggling, to protect those who are striving for holiness, maybe that's something that we need to have a serious conversation with one another. The biblical view of sex, and I find that one of the ways that breaks our perspective on sex is because I, I think a lot of us think that sex is a purely physical act. We don't understand that sex has been ordained and created by God to have a spiritual connection, an emotional and a mental connection. It's when two actually become one. It is when two become one. And this is from the counseling book I go over. He says, God created it as a process of intimate communication, of which the act of physical intercourse is a significant part. It is a powerful, emotional, bonding experience designed to strengthen a marriage, much as metal rods reinforce concrete. Sex is there to strengthen and reinforce your marriage. It is easy to know another person sexually, but a marriage relationship requires much more than physically, physical intimacy. There first needs to be spiritual and emotional intimacy to build trust, commitment, and communication. This is an emphasis. Marriage is a lifelong covenant to love, to care, and to nourish. Let me make this clear. Sex is not the display of love. Commitment is. Commitment is the display of love. Sex is what strengthens that commitment and it what helps maintain that commitment. So guys, girls, don't be fooled by stupid idiots who say, I love you, and fall into sexual temptations and desires because that I love you is fickle. If they're not going to put a ring on it and commit to you for life, that is not love. That is just lust. That is just an infatuation. That is just a feeling. Love is a commitment. It is when you feel, or whether you feel like it or not, a decision to love your wife and your husband until you die. It is a choice. And feeling accompanies that choice and reinforces that choice. It is more than a feeling, guys. Do not be fooled by the I love you until they put a ring on it. I made this mistake. That's why I'm preaching this. I know full well 
of the pitfalls of feeling. Commitment is love. The purposes of sex in marriage, there are three purposes. Procreate. Adam and Eve were commanded to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In marriage, in the context of a husband and wife, we are commanded and instructed to create life. This is a mystery in my mind when I'm thinking about, even with Heidi, about having children. It's like I've been thinking about just how kids form the whole process. I know it could be embarrassing, but I'm like, how did God create all of this to happen? The child to form in the belly and the woof the way it does. To have a mind and a heart. To instill a spirit. To form hands, eyes. Like, out of what? It just knows how to. These are mysteries that God, it's, it's amazing. Second, so three purposes of marriage. First, procreate. Second, pleasure. This is from the, the counseling book I go over. Pleasure. And some of you are like, pleasure? God instituted this pleasure. Proverbs 5, 18, 19, let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. God instituted pleasure to happen in a spe specific, special, and a unique relationship with the husband and wife. But when you share this pleasure outside of that marriage and you go into your marriage already fulfilling this pleasure with all sorts of people, this haunts your marriage. And I will tell you this. Your mind, God may forgive, God may forget, but you and your mind, your heart, it does not. When you go into a marriage already fallen into these temptations, you carry along all of these relationships into your marriage. And it haunts you. And to know that maybe your wife or your husband went through the same process, and that would haunt you too. God created, I really believe, and I, and I tell these to the young cats here, God did not create us to date around. He did not. He created us with a single purpose of marriage. For us to be committed to life to one another. And it is for protection. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, 3. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman her husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. And so he says sex is intended to protect a husband and a wife from temptation. Failure to sexually satisfy each other in marriage can lead to a spouse looking outside the marriage for fulfillment. You know what this verse is saying? You know what the author of this book is saying? Husbands and wives, give it up. Give it up to your husband. Give it up to your wife. To protect one another from sexual immorality. Just because you're married doesn't mean you have this shield to protect you against sexual immorality. Sexual immorality actually attacks married couples severely. Adultery. Divorce all of these temptations. So husbands or wives are to give each other to one another for their protection. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing. And the symbol of marriage and why we protect marriage, why we protect the image of sex, why we protect the union of husband and wife, because it is the very picture of God's faithfulness over his people Israel. It is constant faithfulness over his bride and is the perfect picture of Jesus and the church, of his love to die for his bride and for the bride to submit to love and honor the husband. And in our own marriage, in our Christian context, we protect and we guard this very picture of the way God's faithfulness is over his people and the way the people are supposed to be faithful to God. That's why God in the Old Testament constantly accuses Israel of whoring themselves after other gods, that they constantly were committing adultery. 
And we do the same. We need to guard this picture. And there are damaging effects of sexual immorality. Special intimacy that is supposed to be for you, the husband and the wife. When you share it with others, it does not become unique and special anymore. The picture of love and commitment becomes broken. There are mental ties, emotional ties, spiritual ties to all of those that you have sex with. And I understand that through broken relationships, even for my life, the reason why I am so hardened, the reason why I have uh, issues with expressing myself, the issues with being emotional in certain areas of my life, is because of constant broken relationships, uncommitted relationships that I had sex with. And so in my mind, I have a very broken image of relationships. I have a broken image of commitment. I have a broken image of my own heart, and my own mental things that haunt me. And you got to understand, there's a reason why God instructs so heavily the emphasis to keep oneself pure. And not only does it damage you physically, by mentally and emotionally, spiritually, it does, it spiritually drains and damages you. There is the dangers of pornography, which damages your view of intimacy, damages your view of woman, damages your, your, your purity, damages your mentality, damages your view of love, damages your view of sex. There's the breaking down of morality, and we see that in our culture today. When sexual morality runs rampant, morality is out the window. We see that right now. Morality, we, there, the line has been so blurred that people do not know what is right from wrong, what is good from evil. And there's also the damages of sexual morality is abortion. Abortion is a hot topic, and this is another sermon on its own. But you know that from 1973 to 2011, and you guys, because of the political arena right now, might know this, from 1973... From Raid versus Woe till 2011, so it's not even adding up to today, there has been over 50 million abortions. 50 million killed babies. 83% of those are through unmarried people. They say over 90% of abortions happen from people simply not wanting a child. This is what happens when you do not want to bear the responsibility and the consequence of your actions. That you would cover your sin with another sin to murder life. There are damaging effects to sexual immorality in, in all of life. Not to yourself, but to others. And as Christians, we are to separate ourselves from the way the world views sex. Just like in biblical times, just like James was instructing these Gentiles to abstain from sexual immorality, we need to be radically different in the way we approach sex. To draw that hard line and to keep us separate and holy from the way the world views sex. We cannot, in this place, adopt the way the world views sex. We cannot. Can I get the praise team? Sexual immoralities are an evil. Sexual immoralities are a wickedness. It is something that God hates. It is something that God detests. And certain elements of sexual immorality we went over, it disgusts God. We need to learn as a people to hate sin as well. But there is a, a really big but here. And I'm going to read you this. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 11. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, 
nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. None of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. But this is the beauty of what Paul is writing. He says, and such were some of you. You guys get that? Some of these Corinthians were swindlers, idolaters, sexually immoral. They were homosexuals in the church of Corinth. Paul says, these were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There is redemption for you. For those who are falling into sexual immorality, into homosexuality, into all types of idolatry, into sins, Paul says something so uplifting. There is a way out. And I love that. That is the power of Christ. That no matter how much he detests certain sins, his love is greater. His love is always greater. That's why his son came down. While we were enemies, the father, to show his love, sent his one and only son. That through him we may have life. And so we as a church and as Christians will protect the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of sex, biblically. But for those who are fallen into this, and for the world that has been fallen into this, there is a way out. There is redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is something we have to know, believe, feel, receive, and we gotta live this. There is hope for the world. And for some of us that are struggling through this today, there is hope for you. And I love how today is communion. It is only through the broken body of Jesus Christ. It is only through his shed blood that we have life. Let's pray.